tonight on the Times on Wayne 69. Last night's vice presidential debate had two winners. Cheney and Lieberman each did so well, they ought to be running for president. 40 years is a long time to plan a funeral. But the families of two Miami pilots killed in the Bay of Figs had no choice until now. And the Supreme Court gave its blessing to interracial marriages long ago. But one state is still stuck in the 60s, the 1860s. Live from Whammy 69, breaking the story and breaking the rules. These are the times with Ben Mankiewicz. Topping the times to co-opt the line from the great Brooklyn Dodger and New York Giant manager Leo DeRocher, vice guys always finish last. And as usual, that's too bad. VP candidates Dick Cheney and Joe Lieberman put on such an impressive debate last night, thousands of Americans were asking the same question this morning. Why aren't these guys running for president? Cheney and Lieberman were everything their party's nominees weren't in their debate. Smart, respectful, and dignified. Here's Faye Fredericks on the performances of the men who won't be king. At uh, where we are. The stakes were high, the scene was set, and with some 25 million viewers tuning in, the two vice presidential candidates looked ready to rumble. But a funny thing happened on the way to the fight. A debate broke out. And that's, that's the record. Uh, look, at the 20, look at the 22 million new jobs. The debate was so civil, it almost became a snoozer. If you didn't know better, you might think these guys were the ones running for president, not VP especially if you compare last night's performances to the first presidential debate, when numbers and name-calling were the order of the day. He talks about numbers. I'm beginning to think not only did he invent the Internet, but he invented the calculator. Of course, candidates always look for that, for that uh, cute, little, uh, cute little zinger. He had to be a CPA to understand what he just said. It's like TV commercials. I'll remember slogans, but I may not remember the product. Come to think of it, Lieberman and Cheney do have a lot of experience, and they come with a lot less baggage than their top-of-the-ticket running mates. When's the last time you heard someone call Dick Cheney dumb or Joe Lieberman dishonest? I thought they were on, on issue, on subject. I thought they were excellent. In fact, some strategists say last night's performances will just ratchet up the pressure on Gore and Bush. I think what will happen is next week there will be an inevitable comparison by voters between Bush and Cheney, and therefore there's more pressure on Bush to see how his performance measures up against his running mate. But while reversing the two tickets may not sound like a bad idea, party insiders say, keep dreaming. They did not and could not have captured the nomination of their parties. Dade Republican Executive Committee member Al Hansen says even Abe Lincoln himself couldn't top a ticket these days. Because he isn't a pretty boy. He's not really telegenic. That is a big part of this. The camera rules, and if you are not telegenic, it doesn't matter how intelligent or bright or sharp or how much expertise you have in a particular field. One of the most memorable moments of last night's debate, and one that showed just how competitive yet non-combative the two VP candidates were, was this one about two-thirds of the way into the evening. Today, that famous question that Ronald Reagan asked, are you better off? today than you were eight years ago, most people would say yes. And I'm pleased to say, see Dick from the newspapers, that we're better off than we were eight years ago, too. And most of it, uh, <laughs> and I, I can tell you, Joe, that the government had absolutely nothing to do with it. <laughs> <Interesting. laughs> I can see my wife, and I think she's thinking, gee, I wish you could go out into the private sector. <laughs> well, I'm going to try to help you do that, Joe. Uh, <laughs> Cute, funny, engaging, kind of all the things the first debate really wasn't. What's going to be interesting, though, is what the tone of the next presidential debate is going to be in light of how well received the vice presidential debate was when they kept it nice, essentially. Yeah, I find it hard to believe that they're obviously not getting the message, meaning Gore and Bush. I suspect the next debate will be much more civil. Gore himself said this week that he'll try and do away with the, uh, and the uh, uh, you know, which, of course, made him seem like an 11-year-old brat. Here's something to watch for, though. This race is so tight that some people are saying eventually one of these candidates is going to go negative. Try and give themselves the edge, much like you saw in the primaries, really on both sides when it got real tight toward the end. That can be debate three. Dave Fredericks, thanks very much.
Let's do the web poll of the question tonight. If you could flip the ticket and make Cheney and leave him in the nominees instead of Gore and Bush, would you? A, yes. B, no. C, never mind the flipping. Is it too late to get a refund on the ticket? Please participate. You can vote in the web poll by checking out our website, randy.citysearch.com. Once you're there, click on the Times. Results on Monday. In addition to our satirically insightful reporting on the democratic process, we're also fostering it by offering free airtime for congressional, state, and local candidates. Office seekers can email us at the times at miamiusa.com or call us 305-604-6200 to arrange a taped on-air segment, which will run air on an upcoming program. We will also provide a forum for candidates to engage in five-minute mini-debates, we'll call them. He is exactly like you in every way. One eight in his I shall call him Mini Me. Mini Me! It's only, of course, one eighth the actual length. Time now for a story on the big Senate race. You're likely assuming we're talking about the New York Senate race between Hillary Clinton and Rick Lazio. Nope. It happens to be a race as combated and as close right here in Florida. But as Alan Cohn reports, many voters don't even know who's running. Did you hear there's one barn burner of a U.S. Senate race taking place in Florida right now? I, I, been reading the paper and I haven't been keeping too much track of it. You know, the one featuring one of the most conservative members of Congress and rabid Clinton hater against one of the state's best known Democrats, a former congressman who flew in space on board the shuttle. Republican Henry Hyde. And the second guy, I don't know, Clay Shaw is the other guy. And Bill? No, sir. No, sir. Impeachment of the president. I know. Insurance commissioner. In space on the space shuttle. The two men running for U.S. Senate. Uh, I don't know their names. Who are they? They are Bill Nelson uh, and Bill McCollum. You know where he stands. Bill and Bill. And they're running for the Senate seat being vacated by Connie Mack. That's the way to go. Maybe you've heard of him. It's just a boring race, frankly. I hope it's not true. They're equally unloved. I see on the TV here. They're equally unknown, more to the point. Okay, maybe neither one of them are Mr. Personality. Maybe both of them make Al Gore look like he exudes charisma. But we are talking about who we are going to send to Washington, and we're talking about what kind of representation we want that to be. A mainstream Democrat like Bill Nelson, or a Republican who on the political spectrum is... I think he's somewhere between right wing and off the deep end. I, for one, would have a hard time not voting to impeach the president. Remember, Bill McCollum is the guy who called Oliver North a hero after selling missiles to the Ayatollah. If we leave this president alone, if he... Yet he took the lead in trying to impeach the president during the Lewinsky scandal. The fact that he was willing to look the other way on the much more serious accusations in Iran-Contra just demonstrates the hypocrisy of the stand that he took. He's a hypocrite. I think he is. As for Bill Nelson, he hasn't done anything that outrageous, but it's hard to find anything he's done at all. From the frontiers of space to the... Except, of course, fly on the shuttle. Is it the character that he uses influence on that committee to get himself a ride on the space shuttle? I don't know. Okay, where were we? Maybe this explains the interest level or lack thereof in the Florida Senate race, says political consultant Tim Keegan. It's a third-tier race, and I'll tell you what it ranks behind. The presidential race of Al Gore and, of course, George W. The Senate race of Hillary Rodden Clinton and Rick Lazio in New York. After all, it seems, half of us South Floridians are former New Yorkers, yours truly included. But really, folks, unless you're a snowbird, you're voting here. Pay attention. Oh, man, I hate so far, a little bit. Uh, you're not right. By the way, did you actually know there is a third candidate running for the Senate? State Representative Willie Logan of Opelaka. You may well have heard of him, but I bet you didn't know he was running for the Senate as an independent. For the Times on 1969, I'm Alan Cohn. Bill Nelson campaigned today in Orlando with Al Gore. Meanwhile, George W. Bush will be in Miami over the next few days to raise money for Bill McCollum. Great times now. We'll have these stories when we come back. Two combat pilots, killed in action in 1961, finally come home, giving their families the closure they need and fought so hard for. Also, we'll tell you why Puff Daddy and Jennifer Lopez can't get married in Alabama. And 
Will Meet the Parents do better at the box office than Ben Stiller does on his polygraph test? Have you ever watched pornographic videos? You're watching The Times on Whammy 69 with Ben Mengowitz and reports tonight from Faye Fredericks, Alan Cohn, Miguel Piedra, and Steve Oldfield. Those stories and more when The Times returns on Whammy 69. father disappeared without a trace. In 1978, she got a message from the Cuban government. We have the body of an American pilot. But was this pilot her father, Thomas Willard Ray? Castro was threatened to bring this American's pilot to the UN and throw him on the general assembly table. Castro accused the U.S. of sending the American pilot and three others to assassinate him during the Bay of Pigs invasion. And he was right. Thomas Willard Ray was on a mission to bomb Castro's headquarters in Havana, but Castro's forces shot him down over Cuba on April 19, 1961. For a short moment in time, these men, these four Americans, were the most important people on the face of the earth to the United States, and then they just disappeared off the radar screen. For 18 years, no one would tell her what happened. Not the U.S. government, not the Cuban government. The message from Havana in 1978 was the first time anyone ever contacted Janet about her father. But there was a catch. We had to go through the identification process. The Cuban government said they would not release the body of the pilot unless Janet could prove it was her father. She turned to the United States military to help her, but they turned her down. My government would not come up with the fingerprints or uh, would not come up with the dental records for him. So she searched on her own. Finally, I found, uh, I had some, t uh, some dental impressions for when he had knocked out a tooth um, in high school. And we, were, we sent those directly to uh, Cuba. That was enough for the Cuban government to positively identify the body as Thomas Willard Ray. And Janet was given more proof. An author working on a book about the Bay of Pigs invasion gave her pictures of her father's body lying next to his co-pilot in Cuba. The Cuban government told Janet her father survived the plane crash but died in a gun battle near the crash site. She also found out that at the height of the Cold War, Fidel Castro used Thomas Willard Ray's remains as propaganda. The body was preserved and put on display in a morgue for 20 years. Janet had finally found her father and identified him, but she still couldn't get him back. Fidel Castro wanted $36,000, his fee for storing the remains. When I found him in the morgue, that was very painful, and I thought, how could they violate him all these years? And the Cuban government now is saying, well, we kept him for the family. Janet refused to pay a ransom. 
and in the end, Castro gave in. Thomas Willard Ray was brought home to Alabama and buried in December 1979. I had to give up my last memory of him and look at him after he looked 18 years later in that coffin, and I said, that will haunt me, haunt me for the rest of my life because if I had not looked at him, I never would have believed it was him. For the Times on Wendy 69, I'm Miguel Piedra. Funerals for Crispin Garcia and Juan de Mata Gonzalez are scheduled for November 11th, Veterans Day. Tonight's sign of the Times begins in Sweet Home, Alabama, where the skies are so blue and the laws are so anti-bellum. On November 7th, voters in Alabama will decide whether to make interracial marriages legal. The Alabama Constitution, penned in 1901, bars the legislature from passing any law that, quote, legalizes a marriage between any white person and a Negro. Thirty years ago, the Supreme Court ruled bans like Alabama's unenforceable, making the law moot, but it stayed on the books, a relic to an embarrassing past. Alabama is the only state that still has such a law, putting it in the rare position of actually being more backwards than South Carolina on a racial issue. Polls show the measure will pass, but with significant opposition. Survey last month found 30% favor keeping the law, though the law can't be enforced. Technically, this means Jennifer Lopez and Puff Daddy could not get married in Alabama, and that's unfortunate because we hear Selma. It's actually their first choice. Speaking, as we were, of Jennifer Lopez, we've got a hole in the ozone that's bigger than her butt. Way bigger. We're talking three times the size of the United States kind of big. Actually, the hole, which opened over Antarctica, is growing now stre stretching over the city of Punta Arenas, Chile, and exposing thousands of people to very high levels of ultraviolet radiation. Ms. Lopez and the rest of us would do well to cover our assets because too much radiation can cause skin cancer and upset the food chain by killing tiny plants. Another break. When we come back, size does matter, at least in the presidential debates. Also tonight, if you're sly, you won't go to Stallone's new movie. And if you think you have in-law problems... But under our roof, it's my way or the Long Island Expressway. And Ted Turner's conspiracy to give the election to Al Gore and dominate the world. resurrected John Travolta's career, Copland held the potential to do the same for Sylvester Stallone. He could put the embarrassing films behind him. Cobra, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, Oscar. Sadly, it appears Stallone will continue cranking out Pulp. If you want to see his latest, Get Carter, you better get going before it gets yanked out of theaters. With a review, here's our entertainment quality control expert, Steve Oldfield. Sylvester Stallone couldn't look any worse than Get Carter. He's wearing more eyeliner than a drag queen. He plays a tough guy trying to track down his brother's killer. I'm Jack Ritchie's brother. Is my brother into something? Why do you care all of a sudden? Because he's dead? I think he was taken out. Taken out. It's a remake of a film that starred Michael Caine in the lead. Now he's back as a bad guy. Just when you thought Michael was over being in any piece of trash for a paycheck. Action! This movie is laughably bad. Another awful choice from Mickey Ward. He and Sly try to make the most of their parts, but when the script is this stupid and the direction this lame, nothing can save them. Skip it. I'm a realist. I understand it's the 21st century, and you've probably had premarital relations with my daughter. But under our roof, it's my way or the Long Island Expressway. Robert De Niro is the future father-in-law from hell, and Ben Stiller's the earnest young man trying to impress him and desperately trying not to fail a polygraph test. Have you ever watched pornographic videos? No. 
Stiller is still the top young comic in my book, and De Niro proves once again he can be very funny when he's not doing the tough guy act. The movie has a few corny moments, but you'll laugh out loud more than a few times, making it well worth buying a ticket. For The Times on Whammy 69, I'm Steve Oldfield. Pete Ferris and Kid Carter are now playing at a theater near me. When we come back, CNN's subliminal plan to give Al Gore a big orange hat. But first, we ask this question. Who said it? In case you're wondering, there is no clause in the Constitution that allows us to flip the presidential ticket. Was it Tom Brokaw, Jimmy Carter, or Newt Gingrich? We'll answer when we come back. Quote, in case you're wondering, there is no clause in the Constitution that allows us to flip the presidential ticket. Who said it? Sadly, it was Tom Brokaw. It would have been great if it had been Jimmy Carter or Newt Gingrich. Let's do the weather. A partly sunny and warm start to the weekend. Temperatures will be in the upper 70s on Saturday morning. Highs will make it to near 90 by the afternoon as showers and thunderstorms form late in the day. Over the next five days, we'll finally see a change in the weather pattern this weekend as a cold front makes its way into South Florida. Highs will only be in the upper 70s on Monday and Tuesday. Time to up. The idea of making up for the Holocaust with money is, of course, almost an insult. But what's even more insulting is the paltry amount billion-dollar companies are offering the survivors, not to mention the years it's taken to disperse that money. With 10% of the survivors dying each year, soon there won't be anyone left to compensate. And perhaps that's the point. Monday on the Times, reporter Danielle Serena reveals how Holocaust survivors are being victimized yet again. Before we go tonight, we'll check last night's web poll results. The question, who won the vice presidential debate? We, of course, at the time we taped the show, had not seen it. You had 3%, Dick Cheney, 94%, Joe Lieberman, 3%, Fox, during the baseball game instead, apparently Hadassah Lieberman, voting frequently on the web poll. Time's almost up, but first this. CNN is the subject of a news story tonight, a story that could undermine the cable news network's credibility. During the presidential debate Tuesday night, CNN gave Al Gore 6% more of the screen whenever both men appeared on TV at the same time. The other networks correctly split it 50-50. Fox News, which provided the feed to all the networks, concedes CNN's error might have been inadvertent. But that is no excuse. News organizations have an obligation to be fair, to be as objective as possible. This fall, you have a choice of two men, Al Gore or George Bush. And you, the knowledgeable viewer, should not be influenced by the arrogant news media when making your decision. Of course, we're just kidding. We're not trying to say you should vote for Gore. Besides, despite the two candidate debates, this is a four-man race, and you need to make a reasoned, thoughtful decision among the four immensely qualified candidates. Now, our time's up. Thanks for watching. I'm Ben Mankiewicz, Read of the Times on Lanny 69, and a fabulous weekend.